Good evening, everybody, and welcome to a very special edition of Your Encounter Today. Listen, listen, there is a great recommissioning that is taking place. It's time for you to stop following signs and wonders. It's time for signs and wonders to start following you. And our guest tonight is going to help you plug in to the end time move of God, not just spiritually, but we're talking practically. How can you get involved? How can you be a part of this last great awakening before Jesus returns? And I can't wait wait to introduce him. It's been a long time since he's been on here, but before I introduce him, I want you to introduce yourself right there in the comments. Let us know where you're watching from, and here's what I want to hear from you in the comments. What do you believe is the biggest issue facing America today that the church needs to be addressing? I want you to put that in the comments along with where you're watching from, and as always, we want to stand in faith with you. We want to believe God with you, so if you have prayer requests, you can put those in the comments as well, but listen... Today, he's going to be unplugged, uninterrupted, because I believe that what he has to say needs to be said, and it doesn't need to be rushed. He's a true evangelist and a prophetic voice to this generation. He's the founder of Living Proof Ministry, the best-selling author of this amazing book right here, Vessels of Fire and Glory. Begin to pray in the Holy Ghost and welcome in the comments our favorite guest, Brother Mario Murillo. Brother Murillo, it's good to have you back. How you doing? <laughs> Alan, it's good to be here. I think we're going to get some serious business accomplished today. Well, listen, we ain't here to play. We're here to get some stuff accomplished <laughs> in the spirit. And I, I think our audience is engaged and they've been, they've been hungry. They've been waiting to see you back on here. And you're one of the people that throughout the year, this is going to be a tough interview because whenever you're not around, I make notes of questions I have for you when something comes up. I'm like, <laughs> I need to ask Brother Murillo about this. So okay. uh, this is a time for me to just kind of dig into your wisdom a little bit and i think the body will be benefited by it yes sir let's go <laughs> all right well i've heard some rumors that uh, there's a possible relocation of your ministry and we'll get to that here in a minute that you're going to be potentially moving across the country but before we get to that i heard you say something that cannot be overemphasized you said that god is reviving a church paradigm that's not just focused on prayer and on worship but on the preaching of the gospel and the way you framed it, I believe is so important for us to recognize. Could you unpack that for us? Well, I'm going to unpack it this way. Soul winning is back on a massive uh, scale. Yes. Because people are hungry and the starvation for God in America was created by the left. You know, hmm. they, they decided to get you and I away from God, but they're pushing us toward God because their agenda is so sickening and stupid and absolutely destructive to everything we love. It seems like Democrats get in a room and say, how do we make people miserable and put them in debt and make their neighborhoods horrible? How do we do all that in the name of trying to improve society? Well, that's exactly what they did. And they've created a phenomenal harvest field for the body of Christ. Well, it's not to say that, um, the prayer and worship that the church has been engaged in hasn't been essential. And I believe this was so good when you, you mentioned this, and I think you've said it several times, the word of faith renewal as an example was much needed to teach the body of Christ how to believe God for their finances or to believe God for their healing. But that was all training. That wasn't the end. No. God was teaching you to believe for healing in your body so you could believe for healing in your nation. You know, there's a powerful verse in uh, 2 Corinthians 10 where Paul, it's like he's speaking to the Word of Faith movement and telling them there's a new day. Hmm. And that's exactly what's happening. You know, it, it says, my hope is that as your faith grows, that we will be able to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you. And I, and I thought about that. Faith used to be believing for a car. Today, it's believing for a nation. Hmm. And when you look at faith, in first Corinthians, in Hebrews 11, you look at this. It said they stopped the mouths of lions by faith. Let me add, how much different is that than to pray for a parking space on Wednesday or confess that you are still in love with God? The faith of our confession has got to deepen, mature, mm. and elevate. And that's what Paul said. My hope is that as your faith grows, we'll be able to preach the gospel in the regions beyond. The church has been on the defensive. We have found ourselves hiding, apologizing, 
retreating, dividing, and doing all these things. And the issue of the hour is this, how do we impact the culture? We have the best strategy, the best book, the best weapons, and the best captain that any army has ever had. And we're losing the cultural battle for all the wrong reasons. And now we have an event that's happened that absolutely strips our excuses, destroys them. And it was, uh, I'm gonna tell you what it is, Batavia, New York, because we went there to a blue state, the state of New York, and the shocking results are still, the results of our tent crusade in Batavia were so epic that they're actually making a documentary about it because of the residual effect of that move of the Holy Spirit. And, and it's still radiating on Highway 99, but it is amazing what happened in New York. Well, this is what we need. We need our, our meetings, our message to be drenched in the raw power of God. And that's what's character. There are two things that are characterizing your meetings, your tent crusades. Number one, just the gospel, pure, right. unadulterated gospel, followed by signs and wonders. What are some of the things you're seeing in these meetings as God confirms his word? Well, we have seen thousands of people saved where oh. our counselors have to deal with 10 souls at a time when they come forward. Uh, Batavia, Sunday, the uh, 3rd of October, on Sunday afternoon, the 3rd of October, it had been drenching rain for 24 hours. Try to imagine what rain does to a tent crusade. Mm -hmm. My heart sank. I thought, we're done. And so I came two hours early in order to deal with what I felt would be a morale issue with our workers. When I started getting close to the tent, the cars were backed up for miles in all directions. Hallelujah. We had literally thousands who tried to get in the, to the tent. We had 1,900 seats, and they were gone an hour and 45 minutes before our start time. So we had people standing in the rain waiting. And I couldn't wait any longer. We started, a, the meeting was scheduled for 6.30. It began at 5.15. So many people were saved that our workers were completely overwhelmed. The floodgates opened. And the healings began to pop in different parts of the, uh, the tent. There was a woman that had been in an accident where her car rolled over four times. And even though she had survived the crash, she was literally a bag of bones and agony and pain. Mm. And our video cameras caught the moment when the power of God struck her body. I asked her to stand, and uh, I hate this part because no man should be glorified. The Holy Spirit told me her story. And when I tell you that, I want everyone in the audience to know that all the glory goes to God. And I have no use for these ministries that are all over social media right now that boast and brag of their title and who they are and Come what on. they've accomplished. It's all by the blood, folks. It's all yes. by the cross. We are sinners saved by grace. And I have no uh, right to boast of anything except my salvation. But I looked at her and God told me, car accident, broken bones, agony in all of her joints. That woman stood up and her brother is sobbing. He's sitting next to her and he's sobbing because he, he's nodding his head, almost getting a whiplash himself saying, yes, 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 to everything I was saying. And suddenly the bones moved back into place. The woman was instantaneously healed and, and she began running and jumping straight up and down in a way that would have hurt me and there was nothing wrong with me. That's uh, just a, a, a little smattering of what we saw in Batavia, New York. Right? This is what's uh, supposed to follow every, every believer, yeah. but we've forgotten that it follows every believer as they present the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why it was so refreshing to hear you say the emphasis is not going to be on prayer. It's not going to be on worship. We're going to specialize in the gospel. And I've heard you mention before that we've confused divine faith for human belief. And I think that distinction could help a lot of people that are watching right now. Well, the reason that it is so helpful uh, is that the faith of Jesus, the Bible calls him the author and finisher of our faith. So our faith for our healing begins and ends with Christ. 
And just because he said to a woman, your faith has made you whole, you have to ask yourself, where did she get it? Yes. He may have called it her faith, but where did she get that faith from? Jesus is the imparter of faith. And when I'm in a meeting and I tell people to believe, nothing's going to happen. But I tell people to surrender to Jesus and let him give you faith, everything starts happening. And it's, it's the most biblical way to pursue healing that I can imagine. Well, people are going to get an opportunity here in a few moments. We're going to talk about how they can partner with you and actually volunteer in these crusades and be a part of the miracle working power of God because you've got an amazing crusade coming up in February in Hanford, California. We'll tell them about that in a moment. The link will be in the description. But I want to take you back now to an auditorium that's packed with 3,000 people in Pasadena Civic Center Auditorium. On the front row, there's a drunken man who's there mm -hmm. with his child, seven years of age, who's paralyzed, and he's cursing at you, trying to shut down and distract from the meeting. What's ha what happens in that moment? What's going through your mind, and what happened next? Well, I'm angry because uh, we had a 1,000 people that didn't get in the building, and it, it was little Paul and his father, Henry. Henry was drunk, and the reason they were there is Grandma. She had watched TBN mm -hmm. and said, you need to bring little Paul who had spina bifida. That meant that there was a hole the size of a dime in the base of his spine so that his legs, muscular and nervous use did not develop correctly. And so here is this child and uh, his legs, of course, are, are so thin because they hadn't developed. And all of a sudden, I'm hearing this man say to his son, don't listen to this man. Don't listen to this man. He's a fake. And I wanted to know, how did he get in? And a thousand people didn't. I was getting pretty upset with my ushers at that point. Hmm. But God had arranged it because of grandma. The devil hates grandma. The devil hates <laughs> grandma. <laughs> he does. Because she'll pray more than praying hide. Yeah. Uh, and, and when it comes to a grandbaby, there's nothing in the universe more powerful. So they're sitting there and he's drunk and he's disturbing. And then God begins to heal in the audience, Pasadena Civic. And uh, I, I look at him and suddenly he elevates little Paul up above his head and starts yelling, what about my boy? What about my boy? Hmm. And that's when I knew I was a failure. You see, I knelt on that stage and began to put my palms on this floor and just wept because I felt so powerless. And that's where I want everyone watching to understand, especially every pastor. When I am weak, then I am strong. Hmm. I have seen, I don't know how many times in my life, I watched Miss Kuhlman in a meeting stop because she felt powerless and she'd begin to whisper and you could barely hear her. She said, be still and know that I am God. That moment when God speaks is the most overwhelming moment of your life as a minister. And I'm there on the floor, on my knees with my palms, looking down, feeling like a failure because now all of this healing message was front and center being challenged. And the Lord said, I will be glorified. And folks, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you God's going to be glorified. I don't care what the current political villains do. God is going to get his witness. He's going to get his word in and people are going to be hit hard by the glory. And I looked up when I heard the voice of God say, I will be glorified. I looked up and it by it, it was like invisible lightning struck that little boy's legs and he began to bicycle in the air so violently that his father couldn't hold him anymore. And he pops him on the stage and little Paul ran into my arms and I was never the same, never the same. Can you just write in the comments, if you're hearing the story to God be the glory, can you just yield yeah. everything that is in you? to the glory of God, not to your own reputation, not so that your beliefs can be verified or justified so you can win an argument, but will you allow God to be glorified? There's so many people who have who are hungry for this, but they've been wounded. 
They've been yeah. wounded through past experiences, trauma, even within the church. And so many people are defined by what they don't want to be now in the body of Christ because they don't want to be associated with this and they don't want to be associated with that. And I think it was in your book, Edgewise, where you said wounded healers are yes. God's secret weapon. What did you mean by yeah. that? A wounded healer is an individual who failed. Hmm. may have been morally. It may have been divorce. It may have been... Uh, alcoholism and they were in the ministry and when these things happen and we just love to discard people yes. we, we love to put people on the ash heap but god doesn't he doesn't and if the if you read the compassion in the verse in the bible that says if a brother be overtaken by a fault you who are spiritual restore such a one in the spirit of meekness considering yourself lest you also be tempted you know i've seen just as many ministers fall who refuse to restore another brother as i've had brothers fall because of immorality oh, wow. i'm going to repeat that i've seen just as many pastors burn because they weren't willing to restore a wounded brother as i've seen men and women fall because of alcoholism adultery or or moral failure and i'm not condoning moral failure in fact i'm going to tell you just the opposite there is nothing purer than someone who is a mary magdalene who sinned much and now loves much and consider the fact that a wounded, a wounded uh, person brought back by god He's got the eye of the tiger. Hmm. The devil had me once. He'll never have me again. I know I'm back. I'm like Lazarus. I'm a dead man. And I'm, I'm here. And every second is a gift from God. I've got nothing to boast of, nothing to fear, nobody to impress. And I'm going to just do the will of God. They're amazing people. Well, if that's you, if you're listening to this right now, just write, just write in the comments, that's me, because I believe God's bringing restoration to those who have been wounded, even if it's, oh, it's one thing to have a God who will heal you and deliver you and restore you of something that was no fault of your own, but oh, for the love and the grace of God that can reach you in the middle of a mess that you created Amen. and redeem you and use you for his glory. And I'm fascinated as I hear you talk about this, just as a minister, when I, when I hear you say you heard got a word of knowledge about her situation. What does that look like? How, how, how do ministers yield to this gift, these giftings, for example, like the word of knowledge in your life? I know it's different for different ministers, but just as a practitioner, what does that look like for you when you're ministering? You know, I, I'm going to tell you uh, what you just said is an interesting point because it is different for everyone, but it is also very much the same. Yes. And that sounds contradictory, but it isn't. One of the elements that's crept into the body of Christ, the spirit-filled community, is New Age terminology. Hmm. And what it does, New Age takes the supernatural, turns it from a relational heart power to a cold electrical current in the mind. Wow! So suddenly you're relating to God, the way that uh, somebody, uh, Harry Potter or, mm -hmm. or someone, a magician or a sorcerer would relate to God. How do you know that? They use a term like activate. And I know we're going to get emails on this, Alan. <laughs> so, and, and, but the, the term activate drives me up the wall because you can activate a credit card. You call the number and you activate your credit card. You can activate an account. You have the volition and the will. And when people advertise a weekend, come and we'll activate the prophetic gift in you. Well, what that does, it says this. You don't know the moral condition of all the people you've just invited. You've guaranteed a across the board activation of the supernatural when it becomes an issue of heart who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord except he that has clean hands and has not lifted up his soul to vanity? Hmm. The gifts of the Spirit were described as in, in 1 Corinthians 12, they were listed. In 1 Corinthians 13, 
the motivation and the fuel for them was described as love. And love does not wish evil on anyone, and it does not rejoice in iniquity, and it's not self-serving. So you go through the list of 1 Corinthians 13, and we got to reread it. Before I get all hot and bothered about being a prophet or being a person that operates in the miraculous, am I a person of love? Hmm. Am I an individual that is a, a, a clanging gong and a tinkling cymbal who is willing to go to extremes of outward acts of service ah. whose motivation are purely... For, so let me finish uh, the, the element of the word of knowledge. Every pastor and every preacher can operate in the word of knowledge if they begin with this statement. It's whatever the Holy Spirit wants to do. Mm. He, he divides the gifts severally as he wills. The Bible says seek gifts. Love will make you want to prophesy correctly. Yes. Love will want you to lay hands on the sick correctly. But in 1 Corinthians 14, something very powerful happens. It shows you the element of the heart because that's where it is. All the issues of life are in the heart. A wrong heart uh, will never, talent will never erase the deficit of a wrong heart. Outward audacity will never replace the element of a wrong heart. When a heart is right, then they can operate in the miraculous and they will do it for the right reason and they won't take the glory. But I want to finish. I'm preaching, and I have conviction. You've had this when you've preached, Alan. You'll have your notes, mm -hmm. and you'll be speaking to people, and then all of a sudden, you'll leave your notes behind because you got a sudden, intense thought, uh, an idea, a revelation from Scripture has just jumped in your spirit, and you know it is spontaneously from God. And here's the word that really makes it work, is conviction. You feel convicted that something is true. The word of knowledge is that in the, in the, the factor of being in possession of facts that you have no right to have and no possible explanation for them. The next thing, and I want to say this very carefully, and I know we have time limit, but we got to be careful to understand that once God speaks to us does not mean that we immediately speak it out. Oh, that's so good. The Holy Spirit gives you the option of waiting. Sometimes I've waited 45 minutes mm -hmm. before I, I may have received in the middle of a sermon, in the beginning, I may have received it in the car on my way over there. And that will percolate in my spirit for several minutes. And this is what I believe is immature, is when preachers get an impression and immediately share it. And then they'll be wrong because they didn't wait. And I, I truly believe that it's a conviction of the heart and not an impression in the mind. And we've got to get away from that new age garbage. Well, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And it is not just the gifts of the spirit. It's the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So holiness, the pursuit of holiness, the willingness to obey the commands right. of God is kind of the the um, tryout, if you will, for the operation of the gifts of the, of the Holy Spirit and to love God and to love other people. And, and you're doing that in your crusades. And we're seeing that manifested uh, all across Highway 99. Um, yes. I, I, oh, I, I want to hear. I remember this hearing this one <laughs> testimony of a young man driving down Highway 99. Semi truck. A semi truck. What was it that happened in his life? Well, he had been in the ministry and got burned out, and his mom was praying for him. This young man had tried to lead a group, and unfortunately, he was unfairly treated. And it his reaction wasn't right, but it. So he's driving up a, a highway. He doesn't really know where he is, and uh, so he's driving there, and all of a sudden he starts sobbing and he starts praying in tongues and he's overcome by the glory of God and, and he's totally restored to Christ completely. And he calls his mom on the phone in the midst of it and he said, Mom, the fire of God is on me. And she goes, Honey, where are you? 
She said, well, I'm between Bakersfield and, and Fresno. And what highway are you on? She said, I'm on highway. He said, I'm on highway 99. <laughs> and she had just watched a TV show where I was on it. She said, son, don't you realize that's where Mario Murillo said the glory is falling, is all up and down that highway. And sure enough, there it was. Well, we're planning one of the largest soul winning events in one of, of the hard hit areas along Highway 99 in February on the 20th of uh, 2022, on February 20th. Our new tent is 16,000 square feet. It's wow. twice the size of the one we're using now. We are going to be advertising and believing God for one thousand volunteers hmm. to come to California. We're already approaching 200 right now, but my goal is 1000 volunteers to converge because we're going to hit the cities of Visalia, Merced, Fresno, Dinuba, Hanford, and Selma, and so many Clovis. We're going to, we're going to hit Kingsburg, California. And hundreds of thousands of people are going to see billboards on the main freeway, inviting them to come and be healed and saved. We are looking to God for the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit that California has seen in 50 years. That's exactly what our target is. Wheelchairs emptied, blind eyes open, and people being brought to Christ on a level that has been unseen in decades. And it's time. In the hardest hit state, it is time for the glory of God to be uh, revealed. And anybody can be a part of it. It doesn't matter That's where right. they are, where they're from. They could be in the middle of nowhere, North Carolina, and they can sign up. To, you, listen, ladies and gentlemen, you don't want to go to this crusade. You want to help make the crusade possible. That's you it. want to be on the tip of the spear and say, I was a part of that. I did that. So you're letting anyone sign up and volunteer. Is that right? Yes. What we're doing is we'll train you. We'll hmm. train you. We'll take you on the streets. If you want to go with us, we'll take you right into homeless camps. We'll take you into where uh, neighborhoods where gangs operate. You say, well, Mara, that's dangerous. Not if you're in the will of God. Hmm. In, if, you're in, if you're out of the will of God, Maui in Hawaii is dangerous. It doesn't matter. <laughs> the peace of God will be on you. And you'll have an experience you'll never forget. Uh, we have a higher rate of repeats. So, for example, we had 300 volunteers in Modesto. Uh, then we had 600 volunteers in Batavia, New York. So in Hanford, we're going to have a thousand. Wow. And they're going to be the most excited, overwhelmed, um, electrified group of people in America. And the thing we love is that when a pastor comes and works with us in these neighborhoods and in these uh, areas, they go back. Absolutely. They, they arrive a kitty cat. They go home a lion. <laughs> An unstoppable uh, force for God in their church. Well, churches, listen, elders, deacons, send your pastor and come with them. Sign up. MarioMarillo.org right. is where they can connect with that. And if you don't think events like this, as they begin to happen across the nation, can't turn the nation around, then you're not paying attention. Because right That's now cool. we are in a moment, a strategic moment where everything can change. We just need 50 right. million hand grenades. <laughs> There you had to go. This is what I love about you, man. You do your homework. <laughs> well, we got to hear about it. We got to hear about this. It's the coolest thing I've ever heard. I'm, I'm writing a book right now um, about unlocking the armory of God and taking stories from history and warfare in the past and, and showing how we can pray and apply it. And when I heard your story about 50 million hand grenades, I said, Dad, gone it. He had to get there first, didn't he? 50 yep. million hand grenades. What a story. Tell us about that. Okay, Franklin Delano Roosevelt ran for re-election by attacking four men. Uh, one was Boeing, mm -hmm. which we now know as Boeing Aircraft. The other is Henry J. Kaiser, the F Henry Ford, and Pierre Dupont. Now, these four men were the titans of American business at the time. 
And he felt that he had a populist message that if he insulted them and he, and he exposed them as all being crooks and dishonest, that he could win. And sure enough, he did. Then December 7th happened. And on December 7th, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. Hmm. And five days later, Hitler declared war on the United States. So we had a war on the, in the East and a war in the West. And we had to build the American war machine to defend freedom. And he had to sit with four men that he had alienated that hated him <laughs> and that were all waiting to just let him know exactly how they felt. And he had to give the speech of his life. And that is the speech that I feel that I am crisscrossing America giving mm -hmm. right now to some of the most important Christian leaders. And what he said to them is this, why wouldn't you build these machines that we need? Why wouldn't you do it? And they said, because we have to protect our business and our grandchildren. And he looked at him and he said, you're not going to have a business or freedom from your grandchildren unless we destroy this evil. That same moment, and I, I'm going to get back to what they did. That moment is on you and I right now. That yes. moment when Christian leaders have got to forget that they're Assembly of God, Foursquare, mm -hmm. Baptist, Methodist, they're Americans. The Democratic Party has made it exceedingly clear that their target is the church. And their target is our morality and our children. They have done everything in their power. Nobody could have said it better than the congressman in Texas who recently shifted from being Democrat to Republican. He said the idea of defunding the police is insanity. The idea of destroying the oil industry is insanity. What's happening in the southern border is insanity. And the debt that they've just heaped on us is inexcusable. So now we must build the American revival machine. Mm. We must unify. And so Pierre DuPont, who had built the Empire State Building and took over General Motors, was going through a line when the scientists of the U.S. Army were showing him the newest hand grenade they were going to use in World War II. And he asked them, how many of these do you need? And he looked at Pierre DuPont and he said, 50 million. <laughs> That's how many we need. Well, listen, he went ahead and the soberness of it gripped him. And what we need now is not church as usual. We don't mm. need another Sunday morning. You, pastor, have got to lose your insecurity about church attendance and marketing yourself and trying to get members. You've got to save a nation. You've got to save a country. And it begins in your pulpit. It begins by repenting. Let me give you a, a sample sermon right now. I want all of you in my church to know that I've been a yellow-bellied mm -hmm. coward and that I have stood here and given you all sorts of excuses and diversions, and I can't do it anymore. I can't live with myself. I've got to tell you that marriage must be restored. Yes. I've got to tell you that American freedom and American constitution must be defended. And I'm going to do everything in my power to oppose any school board that is trying to teach us racism or alternative lifestyles or put a man in my little girl's bathroom hmm. at school. I'm against it. I'm going to fight it. And as long as we use the excuse that this, you know, if I start speaking that way, I'm going to lose members. If you don't speak out, Pastor, you're going to lose your whole church. Yeah. You're going to lose your right to even meet. And if you sit there and say, oh, it's not that, it's not real. That's exactly going back to FDR. Franklin Delano Roosevelt told these boys, look, if you don't act, none of this is going to be here. There's going to be no Boeing, General Motors, Kaiser Aluminum. There's not going to be any DuPont Chemical or General Motors. It's not going to be here. America's not going to be here. Same way. And so here's what Henry Ford did. He built a factory that could construct 
a B-25 bomber every 60 minutes. We, Henry Kaiser, found a way to build battleships where every day in San Francisco Bay, raw metal would begin in the morning. And by that evening, a Liberty ship is sailing out of the Golden Gate Bridge, loaded with ammunition and food and medicine for soldiers. And the best one of all was Boeing, who ended up building 8,700 aircraft, bombers and fighter planes. It was an astonishing moment in American history. And we're at that moment right now. We have got to build the American revival machine. And we've got to quit th thinking that we can all be divided and separated from each other and let this thing happen. No, it's time. We had an election stolen. We had a pandemic foisted on us. Mm -hmm. I love a, a little country song that just came out from Gary Chapman that it goes like this. He took the old Johnny Paycheck song and rewrote the words, and it's take this jab and shove it. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I, I just think it's an am it's amazing moment. And if the people are ahead of the pastors, how embarrassing is that? Wow. I think a lot of pastors are at our place right now, as you were talking, I was reminded of something that you had written a long time ago where you said you had to repent for the misplaced courtesy you had been showing the devil. I can't tell you how important that statement is. Yeah. You know, I, I really believe that, that pastors and leaders are depressed and they don't realize that that depression, that weariness, that discouragement, is an attack of Satan that they've got to neutralize by the authority of the cross and the blood, that they've got to do that today. They've got to realize I'm not just overworked. I'm not just uh, fighting division in my church or not knowing what to do in, with all these new laws. No, you're fighting a spiritual depression and a weariness of heart. And you've got to, the Bible says that we take that authority by the action of the cross on the ground of the cross. And it will leave you. It will lift off of you. And you know what's going to do? It's going to be replaced by an excitement. Is my task impossible in the natural? Yes, it is. Am I daily assaulted by criticism from all directions? Yes, I am. Is there not in my life a regular moment where I have to believe God for hundreds of thousands of dollars and millions in some cases in order to keep the forward motion of the great movement that I'm a part of? Yes, it's true. So if I have the drain of that, the drain of the criticism, the drain of the opposition, the drain of the disappointment of cowardly preachers. Why do I have so much joy and peace? Because I'm living off of a fuel that is supernatural. I'm not relying on my human temperament in order to get the job done. I'm in the closet of prayer. I'm, I'm sold out, on fire, drained, dead to self, living under the authority and the anointing of Jesus Christ. What a wonderful place to be and how ridiculous it makes everything look. Well, it's and someone may be saying, why are we tying all of this together? Because healing comes from hatred. Healing, the power to heal yeah. comes from hatred. I learned that from you. What does that mean? The verse says, because you have loved righteousness and hated iniquity, Therefore, the Lord has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your brethren. Jesus attacked sickness. It was, and, and it's interesting that he read those verses in Luke chapter 4. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach good news. And then he listed, the, set the prisoner free, to open the eyes of the blind. And he listed this, the miracles that he would do in fulfilling the precise words of Isaiah. And at the end of that list of verses, the words appear, the year 
of the vengeance of our God. Mm. The Bible says, for this purpose was the Son of God. 1 John 3, 8, for this purpose was the Son of God revealed that he might destroy the works of the devil. He went about doing good, Acts 10, 38, healing all who were oppressed of Satan, for God was with him. Christ had a, what they call in the military, the, the most intense attack there is, is this phrase, attack with extreme prejudice. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's exactly how Christ felt about sickness. And that, that's the way I feel about it. When I go into a tent and I see what the devil has done to people's bodies, mm. I am filled with a divine vengeance, vengeance to set them free in Jesus' name. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because, because is the most important word in that statement. What's, what's that mean? There's an, there's an assignment there, isn't there? Yes. And when you know what God wants, you see our ministry at this moment lives and dies in the prayer room. Hmm. It was Arthur Matthews who said, the history of a ministry is written in its prayer life. And our sense is we go where God tells us to go. We don't go unless God tells us to go. We don't go until God tells us to go. But when he tells us to go, we do not hesitate, not even for a moment. Hmm. Because is the powerful word there. I think that men of God fail. Men and women of God fail because they go from obeying God to sustaining their success. Ah. And they forget why they were anointed in the first place. And like I, I say this all the time, uh, celebrity, right now, people are, that have never heard of me are suddenly hearing about me in different places. And they say, man, you just came out of nowhere. And I tell them, yeah, I'm a 50 year <laughs> overnight success. Hmm. And, uh, and I, I look at them and I say, you know what? This visibility, celebrity, and influence are a line of credit to be exhausted in the act of telling the truth. And the minute you go from telling the truth to trying to extend your line of credit by hiring handlers, spin doctors, and marketing yourself, the greatest disaster of the hour we're in is self-promotion. And self-promotion is so pervasive that you can get a, a Facebook page. You can uh, write out a prophetic utterance. You can string together a quilt of statements that make you sound spiritual and fool a lot of people. But the devil is not impressed. He does not respect how many hits your YouTube channel takes. Yes. He doesn't respect the number of followers you have on Facebook. He only respects one thing, the anointing. And I'm, I don't care to be uh, liked and well-known in that arena. I want to be feared in hell. Mm. And that is my goal. That is my obsession. I want the devil to fear me. I don't want people to like me. Well, I think people are listening to you throughout this interview and something is ringing true in their spirits and they want, they want what you're talking about. They know it to be true and they want to engage. They need to be, they need to be recommissioned. They need, they don't need a recommissioning. They need to obey the commission that they've been given. And in a moment, I want you to pray for those who God is going to heal as well as for those whom God is going to use to heal others. But before we do that, ladies and gentlemen, you've heard his vision. You've heard his heart. We want to partner with him in this at Encounter Today. We want to sow into these crusades financially and in every way that we possibly can. And if you want to partner with us, here's what we'll do. If you go to EncounterToday.com right now, go to the special offer page and make a donation of any size to help us be a blessing to ministries like this, then we're going to send you a gift that's going to help build your faith and equip you for this great end time battle absolutely free just to thank you for helping to make Brother Mario's ministry possible. We don't want him to carry the burden alone. We want him to know that there are people standing behind him, standing beside him, and we want to do that together. So you can go to EncounterToday.com, and we'll send you a book. Probably the Ephesian Mandate is what we have available right now, an in-depth teaching on the armor of God that comes with a free e-course just to thank you for helping make Brother Murillo's ministry 
possible in these amazing crusades. Uh, Brother Murillo, before we pray, I want to mm-hmm. ask you this. As we head into the coming year, 2022, what do you believe God is saying to the church? Well, I'm going to tell you, if I got a, a minute to answer that, because sure. I really feel it's important. In 2019, every prophetic word that I was reading almost to a T was saying that 2020 was going to be a year of prosperity and it was going to be a year (laughs) of breakthrough and multiplication and all of this stuff was going to happen. Very few predicted the lockdown Mm -hmm. and the virus. And why is that? They were fooled by a mechanism of flattery and a culture that, that had lost its way. Wow. We had taken the circumstances of America and misread what it meant. And Samson said, you know, I will get up as I've done every single time and I will go out, you know, and the Bible says he knew not that the spirit of God had left him. What happened is Samson didn't lose it that night with Delilah. He had lost it a long time ago. Yeah. He was already operating in grace and mercy. God allowed one or two more supernatural physical events to happen. And then finally it happened. The, where I'm dis, disturbed is that preachers missed it in 2019. They missed what 2020 was. Now, as soon as the pressure is lifted, Look at them. They're reverting back to the words, the conferences, the focus, the emphasis that fooled them before. And I look at him and I said, you were fooled by that before. Everybody getting together to give each other words from the Lord is a waste of time and energy. Everybody getting together to pray for America and and getting words from God, how to spare the nation. There it is. That is of God. Yeah. And so I feel in 2022 is a year of repentance. Hmm. I believe that, that the word from, the, from heaven is this. If you go back to what you were before now, you're due for double punishment. You deserve to lose your entire calling because hmm. of that. This is no time for people to go back and do all the silly things they were doing that fooled them before. 2022 is a year of repentance and a year of God giving us marching orders. And I'm going to tell you, we've got an election, a midterm election, and it's time for us to punish the evildoers by throwing them out of office. It's time for church to have fire and glory in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, your book helps us get a hold of that Vessels of Fire and Glory. And I know you've got a new book coming out in March that we'll have to do a separate interview about. But it's so hard. It's so hard because when we go back to church as usual now, it almost feels like we're in rebellion. Just an average service, just a normal service. It feels like I'm just speaking personally, like it's almost blasphemous what we're doing. Yes. How do we how do we break that and just break into raw obedience to the spirit of God? You know, I, I want to advise the pastors on this. And, and here's one thing I've, I've said to them. One of them told me, he said, everybody in my church is mad. I don't know who to please. You know, no matter what I say, someone's going to be mad at it. <laughs> and he asked my advice. And you know what I told him? I looked mm-hmm. at right now and I said, find out who's right, who's, who's mad for the right reason. Find out the people in your church who are angry for the right reason. If there are people in your church that are angry that you're having church when you ought to be home and not being a super spreader, Mm -hmm. those people are failures. They're, they're, They're fear mongers. The people who want to reopen the church and don't want to suffocate behind a mask and don't want the government telling them whether they should get a shot or not, those are the people to relate to in your church. Yeah. They're mad for the right reasons. Hmm. Anger is often an indicator of calling as much as it is an indicator of the release of the healing power of God. Brother Marilla, hmm. would you would you pray for those that are watching right now? Because they, they're ready to step out. They want to step out in faith. And I think sometimes you just need an impartation from someone who's who's got it, someone who's got it. And we, we, we know that you're walking in it, and we want to see more people walking in it. 
Pray for us. As I pray for you all, and myself included, yeah. I bring you to Proverbs 3. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. and Lean not to your own understanding. Mm. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Let's apply that in this prayer right now. Yes. Lord, we don't want our opinion of what America needs to prevail. We want yours. How I as a pastor lead my church cannot come from my fear or my own gut. It's got to come from you. I trust you to talk to me. I trust you to direct me. I trust you to help me to do and say precisely what I ought to do and say. I want everyone from the housewife to the brain surgeon, from the janitor to the CEO of a corporation, to the college student, to the professor, everyone who's watching right now in whatever field and location, in whatever condition they're in, encourage them, heal them, direct them, and help them in this hour to know by falling at your altar, they will come away with what they need. That if they wait on the Lord, they'll renew their strength and mount up with wings as eagles. Help them, O God, direct them, O God, anoint them, O God, in your mighty name, I mm. pray. Amen. 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 This is the moment, ladies and gentlemen. God is rallying his forces for a divine invasion on society. And the beachhead is Hanford, California, February the 20th through the 23rd. You can be a part of it. Go to mariamarillo.org. We're going to put the link in the description. And right now, we're going to head over just for a few minutes over to the podcast. I want to pick your brain about some things that are happening in the news. But we can't thank you enough for being on Encounter today. My honor and my privilege, and I can't wait to be on again. All right. Well, we love you, Brother Marillo. Again, check out all of his resources. The links are in the description of this video. And if you'd like to help us sow into his amazing ministry, you can go to EncounterToday.com and click on Special Offer to help make that possible. We love you. We can't wait to see you over on Encounter Underground, the podcast. Check it out. God bless. trying to tell you stop playing it safe stop keeping your cars close stop swimming with the current of society i am looking for people this morning who are going to swim upstream i wonder if revival's knocking on the door right now and instead of just praying and crying out for revival which we must do i i actually believe we're in a time when it's time to open the door you're stepping into new things that are for generation to generation behind you. This is not about you. It's about the people behind us. This is how you defeat giants. This is how you rise up and strike the enemy like you were always meant to. And I believe as a church and even as individuals, we need to go from a place of us having Jesus and thinking Jesus belongs to us to Jesus possessing us. I am determined if it takes me 20 years, we're going to get the glory of God on this city and it will touch the whole world. Go ahead and let the skeptic, let the unbeliever know, let those dead in tradition know what they feared the most is about to happen. We about to find our voice.